Hi, I'm Dom Joseph Marie of the Monastery of Our Lady in St. Lawrence in Canyon City, Colorado, and the iconographer for the project here at St. Michael Whittier Church, a Western Rite parish in the Antiochian Archdiocese. St. Michael's is one of the first purpose-built Western Rite Orthodox churches in the United States. And the project of the iconography began about seven years ago. The model that we used is Sancta Maria Antiqua in Rome. The church itself was built in the early 700s and then buried in an earthquake in about 900, which was very convenient because it froze in time the iconography inside the church to give us a model of what a late antiquity Western Orthodox Church looked like. In the nave, the general movement starts on the ground. We were pulled out of the earth. We were given a soul and placed in a garden. As it moves up on the wall, we move into the period of the patriarchs, which is symbolized by the drapery around the church. It reminds us that this is a temporary tabernacle or a tent that we live in and that we're always on the move. This frieze that runs all the way around the church represents our own handiwork, our own part of working in creation to be fruitful and multiply, to bring order to the chaos, to create, to make art, to make beautiful things. And so this represents the temple period during the scriptures. As we move beyond that, we move up into this large area, which goes all the way around the church, which represents where we're at now. It's floral, it's decorative, but it's also bland and pale. It represents the beauty of creation, but in many ways it's been drained of its life. Along this panel is also the Stations of the Cross. In the Western traditions, the Stations of the Cross are very much a part of our piety, and a lot of the colors that we have used in the icons come directly from the Stations of the Cross. As we move up the wall, there's a large band that runs all the way around the church, which is the very first line from the Gospel of St. John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. These words themselves are the beginning and the basis for the Incarnation which is symbolized not only by the gold, which represents the divinity, and the word, which is Christ, but the red bands on the top and the bottom to remind us that the divinity was clothed in flesh. And these words remind us that this is the beginning of our salvation. It also represents the separation between the earthly, here below, and the heavenly, which is represented above. So here on the Western Wall, the saints that we have are the great saints of the Western Church. We have St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, St. Leo, St. Gregory, St. Benedict, and St. Lawrence. And they represent the orders of the Church. We have the great fathers of the Church and the bishops, represented by Ambrose and Augustine. 
We have the authority of St. Peter, represented by St. Leo and St. Gregory. And then we have the other orders of the church, St. Benedict representing the monastics, and St. Lawrence representing the order of deacons. St. Lawrence, of course, very important, deacon and martyr. It's St. Lawrence who, when confronted by the emperor to bring to the emperor the treasures of the church, brought the poor, the lame, and the halt, and said, behold, great king, these are the treasures of the church. On the eastern wall of the nave, we have some of the great eastern fathers, St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil, St. Gregory, are the three great hierarchs of the Eastern Church. We have next St. Simeon, the new theologian. We have St. Maximus, again, another monastic, and St. Gregory Palamas. They all face towards the altar. Their hands are all in a movement directing our eyes towards the altar, towards the crucifixion, always towards Christ. On the back wall or the choir wall of the church, we have medallions of the great women saints from both East and West. We have Saint Scholastica, who would be the mother of Western monasticism. Saint Cecilia, of course, is the patron saint of music. And it's important to remember that Saint Cecilia was made a saint, not because of her voice, but because of her martyrdom. The same with Saint Agnes, a great martyr of the church, one of the very earliest of the women martyr saints. Saint Margaret, a princess who was martyred for her devotion uh, and for her commitment to chastity. Saint Thecla, one of the very first of the women saints. She accompanied Paul on some of his journeys. Saint Lucia, Saint Lucy, the great saint of light, so beautifully celebrated in the holiday of Saint Lucia's day in Scandinavia. Saint Catherine, again, a royal saint. And then of course, the great story of Saint Perpetua and Saint Felicity. Their story of martyrdom is one of the earliest firsthand accounts of martyrdom that we have. Their great devotion to each other, their great devotion to the Lord. It's a very moving story. And then Saint Monica, who's the great mother saint of all those who have wayward children. In the sanctuary on the left side, or what would be called the gospel side of the altar, we have a large panel which represents the women saints. And then on the right side of the altar, what would be called the epistle side, we have a large panel of male saints. From right to left, we have Mary Magdalene, close to the inner circle of Christ, one of the first of the apostles. She's depicted in red, usually in iconography, both in the East and the West. Next, we have Mary of Egypt. She's an older woman. She's deeply tanned by the sun of the Egyptian desert. She's wrapped in a very loose scarf, which traditionally is of a green color, which represents the new life that she's taken on of repentance. We have Mary of Paris, a nun, contemporary from the 40s, martyred in the Nazi concentration camps. And she's the great representative of that link between the monastic life and the social life, her work with the poorest of the poor in the Russian emigres in Paris during World War II. Next, we have Joanna of Chusa. She was the wife of one of the more important members of Pilate's household. So she's dressed as a typical Roman of the period with the veil in her hair, the nice silk robes with the gold embroidery. Next, we have Tabitha or Dorcas. She's mentioned by St. Paul in his letters. She is the patron saint of seamstresses and tailors and those that make clothes. And there's someone here at the parish who that's a very important part of their life. And so we wanted to make sure that we included her uh, as representative. So on the epistle side of the altar, we have the male saints. First from left to right, we have St. Isidore of Spain, one of the great early fathers of the Western Church, followed by St. Raphael, who is the patron and father of the Antiochian Archdiocese here in the United States. We have next to him, St. Moses the Black, again, a representative of the monastic order. And he's a very popular saint among monastics for his great humility, 
for the radical conversion of his life from a bandit and a murderer to a great monastic saint. Next to Moses the Black, we have John Maximovich, uh, the famous saint of California, specifically in San Francisco, and again, a contemporary saint. Next to him, we have a representative figure who represents the great martyrs of China, thousands of Chinese martyrs over the centuries. He represents the anonymous saint, the saint from across the world whose name we will never know, but who intercedes for us close to the throne of heaven. As in the nave, the iconography really begins on the floor with the marble representing the solidity of heaven. And we move from the light marble into this more golden kind of color, which is indicative of what the color scheme is in the steps. Here we move into a band that mirrors the band that we have in the nave. It shows the juxtaposition of the light and the dark, our work and God's work. The design is more mathematical. It is a echo of the fact that God works in word and number. We then move up into the lighter marble and from there into the realm of the saints. All the way around the sanctuary, we have the word Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus in the book of Revelation when it describes the heavenly throne room, which is what the sanctuary is. The cherubim and seraphim are always around the throne of God chanting, holy, holy, holy. Sanctus, sanctus, sanctus. Above that, we go back to the blue, and in that blue is little gold stars. That's part of the Western tradition. Most of us, when we think of blue ceilings, we think of blue ceilings with gold stars. It represents heaven. Here on the Marian Choir, we have the icon of the Annunciation where we have Mary and the greeting from the angel Gabriel asking if she would be willing to participate in the incarnation of her son, our Lord Jesus Christ. The archangel's head is placed slightly lower than the head of Our Lady. In her hands, she holds a book. The tradition is that she was reading from the book of Isaiah. Behold, a virgin shall give birth and I hope that she has the look on her face of curiousness at what's going on, a sense of the import of what's happening, and that there's a certain sweetness to the face. I hope that in the face of the angel Gabriel that you get this kind of anticipation. He's waiting for this one word that everything will rotate around if she says yes the incarnation of Christ moves forward. Mirroring the icon of the Annunciation is the icon of the Ascension. We have the representatives of the apostles gathered around. We have the Blessed Virgin. In the very center, we have Mary Magdalene kissing the rock, the place where Christ has ascended from. And in this rock, pious tradition has that you can see footprints. We have an angel to represent the presence of the angels at this event. The two young men in white who admonished the apostles for, you know, what are you doing staring, look up into heaven, get, get going, get going, things to do. The one apostle that's looking towards us rather than looking up towards Christ is the apostle Thomas. And I hope asking the question, do you believe? At the altar itself, we have the crucifixion. Interestingly, the Christ is clothed with a tunic. The tunic itself is royal purple and has two gold bands down the front. Only the emperor 
could wear that tunic. So it's making a very pointed political statement, as it was making at the time. What it's saying is that Christ is the emperor of the universe, and the emperor of the universe, God himself, is crucified. The lettering above, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, scripturally that's brought for us in three of the Gospels, in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, which were the three main languages of the time, and in conjunction with the sun and the moon, which are both showing their faces in shame because of our execution of the King of the Universe. This brings about in composition the idea that this is a cosmic event. This is not just a man in first century Judea, but this literally is the king of the universe and all of creation is participating in this event. On the left side, of course, is the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is looking in wonder and sadness and hope at her son. And on the right is St. John the Beloved, the evangelist, who is, again, looking with wonder on what's happening and in his hand is the gospel, which he will come to write later. The cross itself is into the rock. The rock itself is traditionally above the grave of Adam, so that the blood from the crucifixion runs down into the earth as the blood calls from the earth and literally anoints the body of Adam in the earth. Again, it's a cosmic event. This reaches back to the beginning of time and forward into the end of time. body of the church, the architecture, the decoration, the iconography, all should bring us into this great story of our redemption in Christ and in God.